So hello everyone. Uh, we are really very pleased today to welcome Professor Alexis Antoniadis from Georgetown University in, in Qatar. Uh, Professor Antoniadis will uh, speak with us about the uh, blockade against Qatar and whether it's a blessing in a disguise. It's probably the first time uh, I personally have seen some work on the subject, although it has been discussed a lot in, in the media. It's an economics talk, and we are really hoping that we can all learn from, uh, from this talk. Uh, Professor Antoniadis, you have one hour, including questions and answers. Again, we are extremely pleased and honored to have you, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Jamal. As I said before, I mean, uh, it, it, it's a great honor to, to be there even virtually and give this talk, but also to meet you. I would love to be on campus. You have a beautiful campus, but also it would give me the chance to get to interact more with you, explore some collaboration. We miss traveling, but we have some restrictions. So this time it wasn't possible. I hope, I hope we can do that again in the near future. So I will share my slides before I, I do that. I am an economist like you. My research is mainly on using micro level data and big data, especially on prices to answer macro questions. So in, in that sense, my research is not regional specific. So I've been here for 10 years, but I don't do research per se for the region or, or Qatar, but I try to understand how we can measure the cost of living, how we can use uh, online data prices we can scrape and 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 calculate inflation and so on now i'm using more than 160 million online job vacancies in china to understand uh, labor markets but um a few years back and let me share my screen now as you know um the blockade happened so i was approached by a student rafael jazim and she wanted to do a, a research on this topic. And we have some funds for undergraduate research. So I said, absolutely, let's do it. So it's the blockade against Qatar, a blessing in disguise. And I will motivate exactly what we were doing. So, um, and then Khalid Garadkar was a colleague at the Qatar Financial Center Authority. So his role was to help us understand a little bit the financial policies. But you will see more of this, of this next. Now, uh, just a timeline. This is not the first time that the, the region went through something similar. Uh, in, on March 5th, 2014, those countries severe ties with Qatar uh, because, they, uh, because they objected Qatar support for Muslim Brotherhood, and those ties were, were reinstated six months after. Uh, on May 23rd, 2017, and this is sort of the beginning of the blockade story, some stories appeared on the Qatar news agency uh, that created frictions between the Gulf states, Egypt, and the state of Qatar. And there's some disagreement on about who posted the stories, but in any case, that led to a blockade on June 5th, 2017 by Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, and Egypt against Qatar. So what happened is uh, diplomatic ties with the state of Qatar were cut in the morning. Then they withdrew their ambassadors. Flights were suspended by noon. All this happened just in one day. And then uh, the airspace restrictions were imposed. Now to give you a sense to get out of Qatar, you either go through land, which nobody goes through Saudi or by planes, but Qatari airspace is very limited. So there was total isolation and Saudi, as I mentioned, closed the borders and the Qatar reversals were not allowed from using any ports in Saudi and UAE. So in, in a sense, it really turned Qatar into an isolated island instead of a peninsula. And Qatari citizens residing in those countries were given 14 days to leave those countries. Then on June 23rd, so two weeks later, the blockading countries issue a list of 13 demands. And then on the 19th of the next month, they reduce this down to six broad principles. Okay, so this is sort of the background. Now, 
when you when you see all the things that that happen naturally you know and as here i would expect that it would cause an immediate and total isolation of cutter from its neighbors because again restriction in the movement of products of goods of people and so on all the supply chain was disrupted since most of the things consumed back then in Qatar were not produced in the country. There is very little production or there was very little production in the country, but most of it would come through Jebel Ali ports uh, via Saudi and so on. And of course, there was a big threat to destabilize the economy, the currency pay, credit ratings and so on and to affect the image of the country abroad. But perhaps to somewhat surprise or good planning, the, the country did manage to cope. And I would say they, they coped very well with, with this crisis. They, they were fast in establishing new supply chain channels, mainly uh, by exploiting the relationship with Turkey and getting products from Turkey and through Iran. And that alleviated some of the pressure. I'll show you some data later on. And of course, the issue with the flights was a very big one, but they rerouted flights through Iranian airspace. And that allowed some um, freedom in, in movement. And the Hamad port was inaugurated in the beginning of September, so three months after the blockade, which allowed some container ships to bring stuff to the state of Qatar. Now, at that point, policy makers went as far as calling it a blessing in disguise. Okay, and that was a view echoed by the public and foreign media. Now, it's true that whenever society goes through a shock, it brings people together. So, that, you know, that's always true. It's a blessing in disguise. But there was a view that the blockade became a catalyst for growth and development. Now, let me tell you. Okay, Alexis, that... I have a small question. Yes. What you would you like us to think about these um, results or these outcomes as a um, like causal relationship or something that may more a correlation? How, how so should... I will, well, this, let me go through the first slide of what it is I'm doing, but this is a sort of a, and background. Now, before I show what I'll do, I will say this is a lose-lose situation. Whenever you have a blockade, whenever you have a conflict, this is a lose-lose situation. So it's not to say whether you know the region benefited or cut that. This is more to say that despite the adversity and all these things, have there been some benefits? Okay. And more specifically, we want to study what does it mean that the blockade was a blessing in disguise. So I'll come to your comment. And we will specifically look at the policy to understand that. What were those policies that have emerged after the blockade? And when we know these policies, did they complement or deviate from past policies? So that is, was there a structural change? Or the Qataris went about doing their business the same way? Or was there like a change in policy structural change, which would sort of answer your question. So really, we don't focus on you know the causal effect of the blockade. We just look at policy. Now, once we understand, identify the policies after, then we have to look at with the policies before to see if there was structural change and what you know. But uh, we want to look at those policies. And then once we understand what were the policies enacted pause the blockade and you compare and contrast them with the policies before, we may be able to evaluate in, in what ways they brought, if any, long-term benefits to the country. And I will be specific on, on what are some of these benefits. So this would answer your question, not on the causality, but are any of the benefits, benefits that the state derived because of a change in policy making or the quality of policy. And uh, so I will present that and I will say, we see a structural change that has to do with the blockade and there are other things that do not have to do with the blockade. So whenever possible, I will try to differentiate. Now, what I 
what I will do, I will show you what, how we do this. And um, I will not offer my interpretation until the end, because I think it's more important to just show some facts because people have different ways to interpret things and that is fine. So I will show you what we found in terms of, of, of data and then how I interpret that and what story I make out of that. And then we can have a, a lot of discussions. So I, I think, and I hope you will find that interesting. So we, we focus on, on policy making. So the main thing is uh, to understand the impact of the blockade on policy making. And to do that, we will first document and evaluate the policy response and then answer whether it was a blessing in disguise. Before I do that, I will take a couple of slides to talk about the early days of the blockade and talk about some data since Jamal mentioned you know, tourism and arrivals. So when you look at the impact of the blockade, so basically on June 5th, 2017, the blockade happens. See how the economy is doing a few weeks later. It's doing much worse than it was doing before. But was it the blockade or not? So this is about the causal effect. So I will answer your first question there. I'm sorry again, Alexis here, just a, a clarification question. Was it expected in any way or was it really received as a shock? I would, that's because I really question. don't know. I don't I know. I think to everybody it was a big shock. Shock, okay. Yes. Now it's not like the situation now with Lebanon, for example. No, 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 it wasn't something that was in the making, it was deteriorating. I guess there were some frictions in the relations, but what happened on June 5th and the speed at which it will happen, it came as a shock. Now, that is not to say the government was not prepared. For example, having uh, food security by having excess reserves, by planning things ahead of time. I think there was planning, but the, the initiation of the blockade on that day and the speed at which it escalated, I think at least to me and everybody I talked to came as a total surprise. And I would say I would say even how it ended came as a surprise. Also, well, we'll see. So yeah. Uh, so now, if you look at economic activity, so now I'm going back to your question. This is where you are before, and this is where you are after, at a much lower level of economic activity. Now, this is not it's not the role of this paper to study that, but is it the blockade or not? Because you asked me about you know causality. There can be three reasons why your economy is doing worse than before. One is seasonality. If you've been to the Gulf countries, everything is dead during the summer months. So you expect that in the, in the third quarter, your economic activity is lower than the second quarter because of the summer months. And even if you haven't been here, you probably know from your experience that during Ramadan, things also slow down. So the blockade happened during Ramadan in a summer month. So it was a double slowing down. So part of it could be uh, seasonality. Another story could be that the economy was already slowing down. So this is a trend. And uh, so we need to identify, was it seasonality? Was it trend? And of course it could be that the economy was doing very well. And then we see a drop. This is a structural change. That would probably be the blockade. So uh, I've done some work I will not talk much about here, but. It was really seasonality and trends. And I will tell you why. If you look at oil prices, oil prices in 2014, they started to decline and that affects growth in the Gulf. So we have four reasons why the economy was slowing down before. One was oil prices were going down that had nothing to do with the blockade, but that slowed down the economic activity. If you've been to the Gulf States 30 years ago, there was nothing. And then there was so much spending to build. Doha is an example, Dubai is an example. But that infrastructure spending has, needs to come to a stop because the cities are built, the airport, the infrastructure, the healthcare. So naturally, there will be a slowing down in, in spending, which is the opposite of what is happening now. Uh, I understand in Egypt building new cities. So there's this massive spending that you didn't have before. In our case, we went past that stage. So now you would expect a slowdown in the spending, which slows down uh, economic activity. And that was the case. Purchasing power is going down because as the projects are finishing, a lot of the high paying expats 
are leaving the state of Qatar. They're getting replaced with others with lower spending power. Many times they don't even bring the family. And we observe this. We are going through that for a few years now. So purchasing power has been declining at a time when we have a mismatch between supply and demand. Too many shopping malls, too much infrastructure in, in, um, in residential buildings, in offices and so on, in restaurants. So there is a mismatch between supply and demand, especially taking into account that tourism decline. So what, what we conclude is that the slowdown was mainly because of an existing slowdown in the economy. But I'll be more specific on, yes. Sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, so, but I'll be a little bit more specific on in which areas the blockade did have a serious impact, yes. Uh, and here was the shock before the announcement that Qatar would be hosting the uh, World Cup because we were expecting not a decline in infrastructure, but probably after the announcement, again, I'm trying to learn more. Maybe we expect more infrastructure, more stadiums, more... Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, so the announcement was made, made on December 2nd, 2010. And, um, but the spending in infrastructure didn't start at that time. They went through a design phase, you know, planning. I think the first tenders went out around 2014. So there was increased spending, the population went up, but in many sectors, spending went down. So if you look at uh, spending, I think the state had to prioritize. Yeah. Infrastructure related to the World Cup is a priority, but everything else has to decline. Yeah. But do I fact, understand that basically the infrastructure- I'll give you, I'll give you a data business. point. And uh, so when, when Moody's came to, I'll give you two facts. When the data came out for Q3, it was the lowest growth in a long time. And Reuters said, GDP growth slowed down no impact of the blockade. And then when, and, and the reason for that is if you were to see infrastructure spending in the third quarter compared to the third quarter of the previous year, it was up, if I recall, 15 or 16% higher, oh. which is substantial. But that is misleading. That, mi that is misleading because the summer of 2016 was an extremely bad year for infrastructure. So in, in relative terms, we went from a really bad year to some spending in the blockade. So it wasn't really the blockade didn't have a serious impact except tourism. So I'll show I mean, you the... Yeah, just like to, to, for us to understand a bit more. So to what extent was the Qatari economy really dependent on Egypt, on UAE, on uh, Saudi Arabia, on Bahrain? Uh, let me show you some data. So we, we look at the economic data and... Uh, Qatari economy was dependent on products coming from outside. So even if the products are not made from the region, they go, they arrive in Qatar mainly through the region. So it was highly dependent on that. On, on importing labor, yes, you have a significant labor force from Egypt, but I don't think there was much dependency in the sense that labor is mobile, you can give visas to another country. But when we, so here are some basic measures. One is GDP and, and see what I said, that like GDP was declining before the blockade and then it went up. And why did it go up? Look at uh, oil prices at the end of 20, uh, at the end of 2017, they start going up. And, and that is driving GDP. Which for this part of the world, for oil exporting countries, GDP growth, and I will make this statement, doesn't really tell you much because it's how many barrels of oil you sell, which is usually fixed times the price. So if a country's GDP grows, it's just because the price of oil went down, up, if it goes down. So this is not very meaningful. But we look at commercial bank deposits to see with the experts taking their money out. Again, you don't see any impact on that. When you look at imports and exports now, exports are not affected. Why? Because the main thing Qatar exports was LNG. That's not dependent on that. But imports, 
you see this drop for about a quarter and a half. And that is what you'd expect to see in the data because of the disruption in the supply of chain. But you see that after two quarters, things went up and imports actually increased. And again, you expect to see imports increasing because as I will show you, there was a big push to set up domestic production. So you have to import a lot of the raw material to do that. We can also look at the stock markets. You see the stock market was declining and then it went up again. It really follows the price of oil. Uh, consumer price index. If you uh, look at food and beverage, there was a jump. And that's because a lot of the food and beverages or most of them came from outside. So now it became more expensive to, to source these goods. But once new supply channels were established after two quarters, prices went down. And that was mainly the impact of bringing stuff from Turkey and Iran. Yes, Jamal. Yeah, uh, these are really amazing and very beautiful and very informative graphs. Do we have any, uh, the, will you show us some graphs about really, where we look at the impact, the, the imports from the, let's call it the countries that imposed the blockade compared to the countries that did not import the blockade, like the orange and the number three, the orange and imports and exports. I would take the, I would love to see maybe the imports from Saudi Arabia, Egypt, UAE and Bahrain uh, compared to the imports from the others. And the same for numbers. No, but I mean, the blockade means that you stop import. So that drops to zero. I don't think it's that interesting to- Ah, it's really, it's, it's, so it's, uh, it's an embargo. It's not like- Yeah, I think so, yeah. Uh, so like and you need to get license. What is interesting to see where, where are these imports now compared to the period before, that would be interesting. But I want to emphasize, this is not the, the point of the paper. What this paper wants to do is study the policies in NACA. But I need to share some data. When you look at arrivals, now that's where the blockade had a huge impact because about half of the visitors to the state of Qatar would come from the blockading countries. Mm. So there you see a huge impact. And taking into consideration the excess supply of hotels and residential buildings and malls and restaurants, the blockade did have an impact, at least in the short run, on, on that because it's not easy to replace the tourists coming from Egypt and Saudi and Bahrain in just two months. I can replace goods coming from Egypt and Saudi and UAE and Bahrain in a week, but not the tourists. And again, you see that in the data, so it validates the, the quality of the data. Yes. Yes. Uh, you, yeah, and I have some data on, on the number of hotels, how the number of new hotels was growing during the time and so were the, the units, the rooms. So you have this excess supply. Now, let's go to the main part of the paper. So you want to understand the policies and this is what we wanted to do. So with Rafia, we said, let's understand what were the policies enacted by the state of Qatar. And the way we'll do that, we'll go and interview people. And we'll say, Jamal, you were in the Ministry of Finance, what did you guys do? And we realized that was not working because we would come to Jamal and Jamal would say, actually, we don't have a database on what the Ministry of Finance was doing. I can tell you what I was doing, but it was such a hectic period that I don't even know what the person next to me was working on. So everybody kept announcing policies, but there was no directory of that. And we thought that was interesting. And we said, well, the first thing we need to do is actually build this directory, this database, because it's important for the history of Qatar and for everybody who wants to study this to have the data. So that would be actually perhaps the biggest contribution, not the analysis. So that's why I said, I want to show you the data and then I can share my thoughts. Now, how do we do that? Um, we realized that in the state of Qatar, and I don't know if it's the same in, in Egypt, whenever a government agency announces something, they send a press release that goes to the newspapers. So all we had to do is, is look at the newspaper every day since the beginning of the blockade, and this is what we've done. Every day, multiple websites, multiple newspapers in printed media and online, 
and extract everything that was an announcement, a press release yeah. by government agency. And then we would take all these things and break them into categories that I will show you next. So we could go back to the person <laughs> at the Ministry of Finance and say, these are all the measures you guys announce. Uh, Dimitris, do you have a question? Oh, okay. So this, is, this was our strategy. We went to all the newspapers since the beginning in the archives, and we found the policies. So for example, for tourism, that's one category we found. On June 23rd, that was two weeks after the blockade, the e-visa platform was launched. That meant, and, and basically, and then August entry visa requirements for citizens of any countries waived. Now, try to remember those policies. One is the e-visa platform and the other one is waiving the rights. But it meant you could go on a platform now and, and apply for an e-visa. That didn't exist before. And it, wasn't, it was not an initiative that we are thinking of launching a platform. No, the platform is there. So this is what we track. So it was this announcement on labor. So just here another question, Alex. Yes. Second point. So what I remember, I, I very well remember the idea about removing the visas, and I recall many. I'm originally from Lebanon, by the way. I recall many people suddenly saying, "Oh, we are going to Qatar." Qatar became a destination for uh, tourism, and everyone yes. was family member I would go and visit them every weekend or so. Was this idea in the um, in the pipeline before the blockade, and then it was? Yes. I'll come to that, Jamal, you are asking all the right questions. So let me come to that. Please uh, bear with me, I apologize. Okay. So it's interesting also to see that these initiatives were immediately after the blockade. So the attention of the policymakers really went on tourism to replace and, and give the visas, which as you said, it raised our question, well, is that a new thing? Is it a change in direction? So I'll come to that. I will address that I have a slide. O on labor, Many initiatives, you know, labor dispute resolution committees form a new e-system for getting permits, supporting compensation fine, and so on. We found many initiatives on production. That was a very, very important thing, right? Everything was coming from outside. All of a sudden, Qatar was isolated. From a food security point of view, they realized we need to have our own domestic production. On your own factory initiative. In 72 hours, you get, uh, you get a permit. Initial to create the largest poultry farm. Myra, was there a question? Okay. So uh, many initiatives on production. A lot of initiatives to establish free zones and logistics, starting with the inauguration of Hamad port, reducing the rents in the logistic zones as a measure to attract new companies to set up there, revising the legal uh, framework to support those companies and so on. On a residency, we saw policies on residency, on exhibitions to promote especially locally produced goods and services. And then what we call other and where you know we, we don't want to create too many categories so you know a lot to combat terrorism uh, launching a captive active cap, capital markets uh, digital plan to empower smes and so on okay so this was the first step and this took most of our time because we said before we can analyze we need to have the information and we would think that the policymakers would, would have the information but they didn't have it either. So what we need to do is go and collect that information. And I think this is the main contribution of this paper. I'll share my evaluation. Once we did that, we said, wait a minute. I mean, this is interesting, but how were the things before? So we went back and then we started analyzing newspaper articles from the day of the blockade and going back every day up to 12 months. So we, because that was the only way to be able to compare and contrast. So before we did find some initiatives on labor, we did find discussion on free zones and logistics, on production and exhibitions and residency. 
the one that was really missing was tourism. So, and now we'll tell you about our interpretation. So there were always discussions about these areas, but the one that was really stood out was the emphasis on tourism and, and really trying to push to get tourists to come. That push was not there before, as was the push to get FDI. So this is what we did. This is just collecting information. There is no, you know, there is no contribution from our side besides doing the dirty work of collecting what's listed in the press releases. Nothing input from our side. And now I will, I want to spend like 10 minutes interpreting from my experience and looking at the data and, and, and you know, from being in this country for 14 years, how I interpret this. But are there any quick questions before I go to the, to the last part? Okay. And I don't see the well, chat in case. I can always ask a question. So, uh, but please guys, please feel free to ask any question you want. So here, so I understand what really happened. Uh, I'm just amazed. So you went to the newspaper on a daily basis for 12 months, like uh, back to 2016, June 2016, uh, looking for regulations or new laws or new policies that were implemented. And then after that, to see really how manual, yes. It's not like you have a software. Manually. Just, no. Okay. So we would, we would, no. What is good is because uh, Qatar, in, when it comes to technology, is it, a very advanced country, which means that the newspapers, the main newspapers they have here, have an online version. So everything that's in print is available online and archived, which meant that it was easier for us to check running queries about policies, measures, or writing Ministry of Finance every day and doing these things. But also it, it, you could write Ministry of Finance and you could select the date and it will give you all the results. So then you could go and manually erase what's not needed and keep it. And you created a database from this. Exactly, entity. yeah. So we put everything there. Now, then we looked at the database and what are the main findings? The main finding, with the exception of tourism, we felt there was not really a change in policy and direction. Qatar has a Qatar national vision 2030, how to become an advanced economy. And it was going through the process of encouraging FDI, uh, improving uh, things for laborers and, and so on. So on the direction, we didn't feel there was a change but we feel there was a change in the process of drafting these policies. So what do I mean by that? For me, I take three things. The first thing is, in the vo is a volume effect. If you count the number of policies that we encounter in the 12 months after, there were three times more than the number of policies we encountered in the 12 months before. So they were not different in direction. So it's not they went from thinking about free zones to not thinking about setting something on Mars. No, it, it's the same areas except for tourism, but now there's more activities, more announcements. I call this the volume effect, just a counting exercise. The second, which is I think a more significant effect was the value effect. And that's just by, by reading the policies, the policies announced post the blockade were more serious. They meant business. I'll give you two examples. One is we launch a platform for e-visa. It means the platform is there, people can start using it. Uh, citizens from 80 different nationalities get free visa we give this land to the free zones. So it was specific policies, binding policies. When you look at what, what counts as a line in our policy measures before, it would be something like that. We announced the formation of, a, of an executive committee to consider a feasibility study for the launch of aquaculture in the country. We don't think that policy has any impact we don't think that policy is binding, but a count post blockade would be, we announced that 
we are launching aquaculture with this framework. So it would be more specific. And uh, so let me, I'll go back to the slides, but you see what I mean by, by value. Those policies were meaningful. So poultry went to 100% capacity by, I don't know if I have the, yeah. On March 17, 2019, the Minister of Municipality announced that, gave some data, and you see the growth. Most of these categories before the blockade were at zero. So I think, yes, definitely it was a blockade that, that made the policies more meaningful. Because I think policymakers realized and that was driven by the leadership of His Highness that this is no time to play games. We have to be serious about diversifying the economy. We have to be serious about doing the things we said we were going to do without any del delays and announcing things for the sake of press releases and media attention doesn't do it. We want things that make sense. So it wasn't really a change in policy and direction, but it was a change in the process. And by process, I mean, when you look at these policies, now you would have technical committees from different ministries coming together, drafting those policies, making sure they will be successful. Before you didn't have the same degree of cooperation and sharing and collaboration. So there was a structural change in the process. For me, now there's another dimension, which is a time effect, the timing of the blockade. And, and to me, that, that's interesting because, and this is my, my analysis, so I'll share it with you. Before the blockade, the years before, oil prices were very high. And, uh, but then a few months before, they slowed down and price oil, the price of oil collapsed in some way below $40 a barrel. And that's why the summer of 2016 was a particularly bad year. So when the blockade happened, oil prices started to slowly go up and that gave a boost. So in relative term, when the GDP growth came from the year before, it didn't look as bad because the collapse in oil prices a few months before lowered the, the base level. At the same time, the global economy was very strong. And that helped the state of Qatar because it allowed Qatar Investment Authority to liquidate any positions they had and release funds in case funding was needed in the banking system. Whereas if it was 2008 during the meltdown, then you would talk about fire sale. But when the blockade happened, the global economy was very strong and that worked in Qatar's favor. 2017, Qatar was a well-known country compared to 2007. It had soft power and it had allies, and those allies stepped in to mediate the crisis and I think make it better for the whole region so it doesn't destabilize further. So that also helped, the timing helped. The, the, the most interesting aspect to me though, is in terms of, if we think of timing in terms of Qatar's growth, and I have a very simple model to describe Qatar's growth and I will present it in two minutes and I will finish with that. So initially Qatar has no money, no infrastructure, but you discover you have natural resources on the ground. What do you do? It's a no brainer. You borrow money, you build the facilities to be able to extract and monetize your natural resources. So this is what they did. They borrow and they establish Rasla Fund. So now, and, and that's the first stage of Qatar's growth to me. Extract oil, sell, get money. Now you have money in your pocket, you have no infrastructure. What's the second stage? You take the money and you build a country. And this is what they've done. So the third stage is now you have, you still have some money left. You have the interest infrastructure. Now you need to go out and get businesses to come. You need to get people to come. You need to get them to, to know Qatar. And I think when the blockade happened, it was really the end of stage two, the beginning of stage three, which is to go get businesses. 
Now you need different skills to get businesses. You need a different and more serious legal framework uh, to get FDI, to get tourism. You have to be serious about how you promote the country, what campaigns you run. And all those policies you've seen, there were things the country was trying to do before, but it really came at a time when they had to jump to stage three and it accelerated the process to them and the seriousness. So the quality of these policies was much higher than the policy announcements before. So in that sense, even though and blockade, a conflict is a lose-lose situation, but the timing of it, it made Qatari policymakers become more, collaborate more and come up with better policies and faster policies for the move from stage two to stage three. So for me, the timing effect was, was very important and not very easy to, to realize. So I, I, I think, of course, the contribution is really to put together the, the database and to be the first in-depth examination of these policies. Uh, Aida, just give me one minute, I will conclude. So when I, I think about the blessing in disguise, to me, of course, it really brought people together. So in that sense, but I don't talk about people now about social aspects. For me, what I what I think it was a blessing in disguise from the um, from this situation was that it improved policy making, especially in quality. And the timing was good because as the World Cup is 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 here in 11 months and Qatar is trying to get FDI, it made a lot of progress since the blockade in pushing the policies to make it an environment where foreign investors will take a closer look, tourists will take a closer look and so on. So it's a blessing in disguise, of course, for coming together, but for really helping policymakers focus, deliver and look at the long run and not take shortcuts. So the desire was always to become an advanced economy diversify. I think it really expedited that. And with that, I, I will conclude because I want to leave time for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Alexis. Maybe we hear from the questions now. Uh, Aida, maybe you would. Hello. Hi, Aida. Uh, thank you, Alexis, for this uh, presentation. It was really very informative. I asked you with regards to um, the sustainability Uh, I know we are not hearing you. We are of uh, uh, these policies. To extent to can, for example, as hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah. Now, yes. Hello? Alexis, yes. can, you hear, can you hear me? Yes, I can okay. hear you. Well, uh, thank you once again for your presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, the sustainability of these projects. The two touristic sector survive uh, after this uh, blockade. Now uh, with, uh, for example, uh, Riyadh promoting for itself as a touristic center. And uh, of course, with Egypt, all the campaigns that they are uh, um, visit. So to what extent can these projects survive after the blockade? And uh, how, how do you think it's going to perform afterwards? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Aida. This is a, a very, very good question, actually. So if you look at the region now, if you look at the growth taking place in Cairo, if you look at Neom City in, in Saudi, Saudi is a big elephant now and it's expected to grow at very, very fast pace. And I think Cairo also and overall Egypt, you have more competition, right? Dubai didn't have any competition before. And then Qatar started to grow with Doha, Abu Dhabi, and so on. So you have more competition and more competition means that some companies will not survive. Now, coming to this, the case of Qatar, either I want to separate between the policies. So putting the right framework to get tourists, putting the right framework to bring foreign investors and protect it, putting the right framework for uh, laborers, those are policies. So I think 
the improvement, improvement in the number and the quality of these policies will, uh, will help Qatar deal with the extra competition. Can you imagine how the country and the companies would be able to survive the competition if you didn't have those policies? Now, some companies, to, to, so I think the, the work done really helps Qatar compete in the added competition. It's not about winning the race, nobody can win the race. It's whether the region, I think, as a whole is able to attract more businesses. So if we think about these are splitting the pie and now there are more elements, more countries, then nobody will benefit from it. But what I think will happen with all these policies enacted by Qatar and now Saudi is, is doing a lot of policy changes, Egypt, and I'm no expert, but they are doing a lot of policy changes. What I think and what I hope will happen is that the pie will get bigger. Now, uh, now, coming on the companies, those policies led to the establishment of a lot of new sectors and new companies. Balatna, for example, is a company that specializes in dairy and it was established because everything was coming from Saudi, from Al Marai. I don't think Baladna will go bankrupt because I think any country should have its own local production. The key question is whether those companies will be able to enter the export market. And I understand many of your trade economies, being able to export is a very big jump and you have to be very productive, very efficient, very competitive. And I think that hurdle becomes even higher now since all the countries are growing. I think that will create pressure on the countries in their ability to export. And I think it will create some pressure on the real estate market either because of the reason you said. There are more options now in, in the region. But the policies themselves, I think better prepared the companies to deal with the competition. Thank you, uh, Alexis. Uh, any other more questions? Uh, thank you, Alexis. Thank you. Um, Alexis, if we, while maybe waiting for other questions, if uh, because uh, as you know, also many of the colleagues here are from Egypt or at least in Egypt, like me, to what extent uh, academic research now around these ideas is possible if you want to do on the empirical front to document really the effects of these policies, like if we think about trade diversion, trade deflection, uh, tourism behaviors, uh, what access of available data is it publicly available? If you want to throw out some research questions, future research or questions for future research, how would you guide us in this direction? Yeah. So I'll go back to Ida's comment. Depending on what you want to study, if you want to I, I would say that we think there was an improvement in policy making in direction, but that doesn't mean that, you know, what impact that did this have on GDP growth, right? Maybe we need a few more years to be able to understand whether those efforts were necessary, but maybe not sufficient. So now you have a legal framework to get FDI. It doesn't mean you will get FDI. We need a few years to see whether, you know, they were necessary, but it's not sufficient. So we will not be able to answer that. Uh, thinking about trade diversion, of course there was trade diversion. How interesting is to document that? I think it is interesting. Now the state of Qatar has very, very good data. So if you, if you talk to customs, I think for any shipment that comes in, they collect more than 120 variables whether it comes by camel, who was riding the camel, and like, it's insane how much data they have. And this is because the country is new, they bring new technology, they collect a lot of data. So the data is there. I think people that have access to data are always open to ways to analyze the data. This is not in direction I have taken, but on the trade front, I think there are data. I know the contrade data for the region, not Qatar, but for the region in general is not really accurate. So if you look at what 
Saudi exports to other countries. And then you go to the other countries and see what they import from Saudi and you add up the numbers, they will not match. Yeah. So I think there's a problem there. I've done a lot of work with prices. I have, um, so I have something coming in the American Economic Review. I have something in the IR and JIE and it use scanner data from the, from the Gulf. So price data, you can even scrape data online from retailers. So that's something that somebody may, may want to consider. So I think, you know, getting historical data on prices on such disaggregate, no, but on the CPI and the components, the data exists. So on the CPI and its components, the quality of the data, I will talk about Qatar. But I think it's the same for all the Gulf countries. If you go before 2016, 17, you know, 15, maybe the quality is not great because of problems with measuring CPI. It's not the problem of the Gulf countries, but the, the characteristic of their growth is that the population was double in every five, 10 years which meant that a lot of the products that you had in your basket three years ago don't exist today, but you have twice the number of products. So uh, being able to have a chained CPI index that takes into account such a high attrition. So in my research, using data in the US when I was on RA, uh, we found that every four years, 40% of the goods disappear. In my research here with scanner data, I find that in two years, not in four, 90% of the goods disappear. So that poses significant challenges on measuring uh, inflation. So the inflation data is there and would be by category, for example, entertainment, housing, fuel, food and beverage, and so on. Um, but the quality, if you go back more than five, six, seven years, would be questionable. So trade data, you have some price data. On arrivals, I think these countries keep track of everybody who gets in the country so they would have the data. Uh, are they willing to share by nationality? I think they would. I, I see an openness whenever I reach out and I need some data, but I, yeah, because I don't work specifically for the region. I don't do analysis on the region. I don't use that level of data. Wonderful. Uh, just like really footnote here, when we say that goods are disappearing, are we here talking about like six digit goods or maybe a little bit more aggregate? No, no, no. I'm talking about barcodes. I'm using at the barcode level. Wow. So if you look at the barcodes, if you go to car food, really in detail, yeah, yeah. and you look at the barcodes, uh, all the barcodes you have at the car food store, which would be around 20,000, and you go two years later, well, not now, but if you did it in Qatar between, let's say, 2010 and 2012 or 8 and 10, because there was such a huge change in population, you would find that the number of barcodes you have in the later period is not the same with the period before. 90% of the barcodes are new barcodes. Yes, I see. Oh, wonderful. Uh, I don't know if there is any other question from anyone. Right. Maybe we can stop here at the interest of time because we also have the classes that will start um, in three minutes for some colleagues. Alexis, I want really to thank you so, so, so much for giving the talk. We really were hoping that you will be able to make it here to this very beautiful campus at the UC. We really hope that as soon as these uh, travel restrictions or frictions are, are able to uh, invite you here and to do some more exchanges. And we, it was really, really very informative talk. And it's definitely, for me at least, it informed me a little bit more about the impact of uh, sanctions slash uh, blockade slash embargo. Uh, I never thought about these dynamics, how they happened before. And then basically, I learned a lot. Thank you so much, uh, Alexis. And definitely, we look so forward. Thank to you so much. I hope you enjoyed the talk. You. And Absolutely. I hope to visit the campus very soon. Definitely. Have a Thank good day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. We'll be in contact.